So this is the last of a short series of five talks uh, that we've been going through on uh, different convictions, important values that we want to uh, hold dear as a church as we move into a new uh, stage in our church's life and history. It's always a, a point of renewal um, as we uh, develop these, these small groups and as we reach out to those around us. But our first conviction about four or five years ago was the importance of prayer, but prayer, among other things, as a way of knowing, experiencing God, of walking in His presence. That was our first conviction. And this is necessary because it leads us into our second conviction, which is God wants to do extraordinary things through ordinary people like you and I. That the key for that partnership, us being partnered with an extraordinary God, to see His extraordinary power at work in our lives and the lives of others, is that close fellowship with God, connection with God through prayer. The third conviction that we saw two weeks ago is that God has saved us through Jesus, has chosen and saved us for fruit, for there to be a reproduction, as it were, a multiplication of His life in us going out and impacting others. God wants us to see the fruit of people redeemed, people following Jesus, people uh, following in His footsteps. Um, and none of this is possible if we don't understand that we're ordinary people partnering with an extraordinary God through prayer. Okay, so all these things uh, build on each other. We saw last week, we looked at the parable of the talents. And we saw that Jesus calls on us to make our life count. That it's better to do risky things for His glory to, than to always ditter and be stagnant and paralyzed from fear. And I want us to look today as we close at what growth in the kingdom of God looks like. If we do these things, if we're praying and walking closely to God, if we understand that God has called us to do extraordinary, even impossible things in partnership with Him, and that in fact He has saved us to do so, there is no other choice, there is no choice but fruit, um, and God's calling you to make your life count. The question is, if we step into this, and if we're very serious about being involved in seeing the kingdom of God come, and God's will done on earth as it is in heaven, uh, what does it look like? What does that growth look like? And it's interesting, this, these two stories, these two brief parables, analogies, illustrations, that Jesus, Jesus uses are like two sides of one coin. They're illustrating for us how God's kingdom grows, what it looks like. And so there are two main things that I want us to consider. And the first is that God brings growth. God himself brings growth. We see this in Mark 4, verses 26 to 29, the first parable where we see the story of the sower, this farmer sowing seed, and then this growth happening that he has no power and control over, even while he sleeps, and then he's involved in the end of the process uh, by grabbing the sickle, right? The harvest has come at the end of verse 29. Uh, we know from earlier in the chapter that the seed that the sower is sowing, that the farmer is sowing, is the seed of the Word of God. It's the seed of the truths of God. And we could attach to that, you know, the, the Word of God coming through people who live out the Word of God, right? Through people, through messengers that embody that message. We're going to look at that actually in the coming weeks in a different part of the Bible. But that's the main idea is these people carry the truths of the gospel about Jesus and are spreading it. And that's the, the image of the seed. And um, I want us to understand a few things. What we're seeing in this first parable, as I've said, is that God gives growth. It is the power of God that assures that people meet Jesus and grow in their relationship with Jesus. It's God's power. But it's God's power through our work. Through our work. So look at verse 26 with me. It says, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. There is the work of the scattering of the seed. And then in verse 29, the end of this parable, we read, but when the grain is ripe, when the fruits are coming up, when the corn stalk is you know, growing or the grain is emerging, at once he puts in the sickle because harvest has come. So even though the power for, for growth comes from God, we still have work to do. That's the point I'm trying to make. We are involved, and in fact, it's hard work. Okay? 
uh, uh, um, planting and caring for, cultivating and harvesting, this is hard work. But the point is, there's a point at which you're working and then you see your work, your efforts, your smarts, your strategies and tactics reach an end, right? There's a point at which you cannot go further. There's, there's not more for you to do. So God brings the growth through our work, but by the mysterious work of his own power, okay? So this is what we see in verses 27 and 28, the middle of this section, right? We have the, uh, the farmer working at the beginning and at the end. That's the bread and the sandwich. But the ham and cheese, the burger, is the work of God, right, in the middle. So look at verse 27. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear, okay? In modern times, farmers... People involved in the agriculture industry have a lot more control over the elements and the process by which they grow things. I saw an extreme case in Singapore, they're growing food in basically laboratories and they grow food vertically in this special material and they can, they can harness the temperature and the humidity and the soil, but to the nth degree, you know, everything about the whole process is under control, right? That's an extreme case. Most farmers, I think, don't have that degree of total control over every aspect, but there is significant technology now for farming and engineering. It was very different 2,000 years ago. I'm not saying there was no technology, that there was no engineering that went involved with it. Certainly there was. But even more than farmers now, farmers then were very much at the mercy of nature, as it were, of their surrounding circumstances, right? Um, they could they could sow, they might be able to till the earth a little bit and try to put maybe some sort of fertilizer perhaps down and try to create the best conditions. But there was a point at which after that, hey, I don't know, the sun has to come out just the right kind of way, the right amount of time. We have to get the exact right amount of, of rain, too much, too little. Um, we have to hope that no locusts show up and eat the, 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 um, the harvest, the grains, or that there, there are no pests, you know, no, no pesticide in the uh, year of our Lord, you know, 33 or whenever this is happening. And so farmers had to work a lot, but there was a limit to what they could ensure in terms of the results. Does that, does that make sense? Uh, Simon K uh, Kistemacher puts it well. He says, the parable bypasses all the details, significant as they may be, and places the emphasis on the sowing, the growing, and the mowing in terms of what the farmer is doing. We should not assume that the farmer spent his days idly, because you can read the verse and say, oh, he slept. So basically, this is a story of we don't do anything, we sleep, and God does everything. But that's not what we're supposed to extract from the passage. So Kissemacher continues, of course not. He had work to do. Plowing and fertilizing and weeding took much of his time. Besides the daily chores, he had to do the buying and the selling, the planning and preparation for the harvest. All this is understood and taken for granted in the parable, right? The hearers understood that there was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that went into getting a good harvest on any given year. Kisamaka continues, we also know that God will provide the necessary rainfall and precipitation. That's where we see God's role so clear. He is in control of the natural elements. That is exactly the point. The farmer, from the moment he has sown the seed, must leave the sprouting, the growing, the pollinating, and the maturing to God. He can describe the process of growing wheat, but, and especially in the first century, he cannot explain it. Okay? So what we're seeing is this partnership. We see it from the very first chapters in Genesis. This is what God always meant. We have a role. We're involved in the work of creation. We're involved in the work of redemption but also completely and totally dependent on the power of God. That's the, that, those are the two sides of that coin. That's the double truth that's coming at us from this passage. We have hard work to do, and yet God's power is the key for it to bear any fruit, any positive result. And that's something that we have to keep in mind. We're, God is partnering with us in sowing and in harvesting, okay? So we're sharing the word, we're sowing, right? And we share it expecting that the same good news of Jesus is going to change other people's lives as it's changed our own life, right? And then we partner in harvesting at the end, right? Harvesting has to do with uh, collecting the fruit, uh, caring for the fruit. Uh, we could say it represents 
caring and stewarding the lives of people changed and impacted by the gospel. So that's our role. So this morning, if you need to break what might be a, a fixed wrong idea, you need to go through what some people call a paradigm shift this morning. Uh, it's not your job, it's not your job to lead people to Jesus. It's your job to lead people to Jesus and see them mature in Christ. Totally dependent on the power of God as you do so. The very first sermon I preached at Cornerstone, before I was even a pastor here, I preached from Colossians 1, the ministry of Paul. And Paul says that he sees it as his goal to present every human person, every person on earth, mature in Christ when Christ returns. Not merely having come to trust in Christ, but growing and fully mature in Christ. And every single person. So we sow, we harvest, and we're totally dependent on the power of God. And any harvest, any result, any fruit is only thanks to the sowing work, but also the power of God at work. So Kissemacher also says the manifestation of God's kingdom follows the faithful <coughs> ministry of God's word. The one leads the other, and nothing happens without the secret power of God. You know, for those of us who are in the connect groups, we've seen this. We meet, we do nothing that's spectacular. There's no, uh, there's no weird substances in the Kool-Aid. Uh, there's no specific plan of propaganda and brainwashing. We gather warts and all, all of us, and we talk and we share our lives and we open the scriptures and we pray, and then we see God touch people's lives. It was very interesting. It's very interesting for me to come today, Sunday, coming from Thursday, which is when my group meets, Thursday, went in with very little expectation, and we saw God work. We saw God work in people's hearts. We saw people say, yes, I want Jesus to come into my life. People who a couple weeks ago would have said, they don't have a commitment to Jesus. I wish I could explain to you how it happens, but I feel like the farmer in the story. I don't know how this happens, but it just does. It just keeps happening. But I also know that these people wouldn't have met Jesus if we weren't gathering, if we weren't praying, if we weren't opening up the scriptures. There's no autopilot. There's blood, sweat, and tears like the farmer. And there's also the mystery of what God is doing in people's hearts and minds as we do so. <coughs> we have no control over, we can't guarantee results. It's just God, would you show up? The second thing I want us to see, and it's the last thing, it's just two points, is that second parable, the parable of the mustard seed, right? And I think most of us have seen mustard seeds, you may even see mustard seeds in some mustards, right? Um, it's not literally the smallest seed in the, in the universe, but in their world, in their known world, uh, it was the smallest seed they knew of. And if you've seen a mustard seed, it's basically a speck, right? It looks like a speck in your hand, if you ever hold one. Um, and... What Jesus does is he shows up and he says, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. And you have to think that most people around Jesus, the, the Jewish people, they were expecting Jesus to be something like what we would imagine would be like a first century Jewish William Wallace, okay? That's what they were expecting was going to happen. You know, just, you know the story of William Wallace, you've seen the movie, you know, that uh, it's the Scots being oppressed by this evil English king, uh, um, and it's about this rebellion and uprising of the Scottish people against the English king. And it's, it's loosely based on, on a true historical figure and a, a true story. But that's the vision that the Jews had. We're being oppressed by this evil Roman empire with an evil Roman emperor, a total pagan. And we are waiting for this descendant of our favorite king, historically King David. One of his descendants is going to claim his throne claim his, his rule, and kick out all these Romans, right? And so we're going to take up arms, it's going to be glorious, uh, and we're going to go into battle. And here comes Jesus, and a lot of people are thinking, this is the guy, this is the, if you excuse the, the, the term, this is the dude, this is the one, right? He is the one who's going to do this. And Jesus stands up, and instead of raising a sword and yelling out a war cry, he says, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. So you, you need to think about how jarring this would have been to the first hearers, right? Uh, it's not how they would expect God should do things, but that's how God does things. He does things this way. He likes to begin small. 
he likes to work through things that are small, through small quote unquote people, through unimpressive people, unimpressive means, in unimpressive circumstances. That's how he loves to work. That's how he loves to set things off. I mean, think about the story of Jesus. If you know some of the story of Jesus in the Gospels, it's a carpenter from Galilee, not an important region or city at all in the known world at the time. And he calls and amasses around himself a movement of followers who were artisans and fishermen, and you had a tax collector in there, and you had a, a, a radical freedom fighter, zealot in there, and it was just a weird small group of what the Roman Empire, the people in power at the time would have considered losers. Losers. Paul refers to himself and his followers as, uh, or his companions as the scum of the earth. But in 300 years, 350 years, a Roman emperor would recognize Christ as his king and his God. This is how God loves to work in history, through his church, and through all of our lives. He likes to start small. Think about your own Christian life. Maybe it didn't look very impressive. Maybe it still doesn't look that impressive. That's how God, that's where God likes to begin with the small, the unimpressive, the humble. So if you're not impressed with Cornerstone, that's, that's a good place to start. <laughs> We're in the perfect place to begin. But what's interesting is, there's always a trajectory of what God wants to do through the small, right? That's what's being represented. This small mustard seed turns into this great tree, right? Jesus and his band, this little group, start small, Midway through the book of Acts, which is about how his followers began to spread through the Roman Empire, taking the gospel to, to different corners of the known earth, as it were, at the time. Midway through the book of Acts, these same people are described as those who are turning the world upside down. God, is, God starts with something small for big impact. It's funny, I'm reading a book on small group ministry, a lot of the same kind of ministry that we're doing here as a church. And the book is called Small Groups big impact. That's how God loves to work. Because it highlights his power. It highlights that he loves to work through weakness. It highlights the fact that he can even work through you and me. That's why this is so important. That's what he's doing. So Jesus uses this image. But look at verse 32. When this little seed uh, sown grows up, it becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Now, we don't have time to get into all of it, but Jesus is borrowing images, imagery from the Old Testament. If you want, you can make note of it, and you can check this out later for yourself, but <laughs> it's passages like Ezekiel 17, chapter 17, Ezekiel 31, Daniel 4. And what we see in those passages is uh, often the image of a tree is used to represent a strong dynasty, a kingship, an empire. Uh, in one case, it refers to the pharaohs in Egypt and the Egyptian empire, which was former, was, was, a, was an important empire of the day. Uh, and Daniel, it references uh, the emperor of the Babylonian empire and his power and the power of his kingdom. Okay? It's the same sort of image, that of a tree that grows and the branches spread and the animals come to take refuge under the branches or the birds come and take refuge in the branches. And what's interesting is in those Old Testament passages, the animals and the birds represent the nations, the peoples of the earth around the empire, who find in the empire uh, prosperity, strength, comfort, etc. Jesus is taking that image that in the Old Testament is almost always referring to empires that aren't even uh, uh, Israeli or Israelite or Jewish empires, and he takes it to speak about his kingdom, he takes this image and uses it to speak of his kingdom, but he adds the element of the mustard seed. That's not in the Old Testament. He said, the purpose of my kingdom is to spread like the great empires of the earth. In other, in other words, to have this great, wide, enormous impact, but it's not going to look like that when it starts out. It's not going to look like that for a while. It's going to look invisible for a long time. It's not going to be impressive. But the purpose is to expand. Expand wide and put down roots deep. Wide impact and deep impact. 
That's what Jesus wants us to understand about the kingdom of God. That's what he wants to do in your life individually. That's what he wants to do in and through your family. That's what he wants to do in and through this church. <laughs> and I say this to say, don't be discouraged if you look around and you're not that impressed. Don't be discouraged if you look in the mirror and you're not that impressed. This is exactly the material that God loves to work with, that Jesus loves to work with. So be encouraged, because what this means is Jesus wants to use you to make a big impact in this world. But like the farmer, though we're totally dependent on the power of God, we have work to do. We have work to do. One of the ways we're specifically trying to do that is through the connect groups. That's one of the reasons why we keep going over this and repeating this over and over again. It doesn't have to be the only way to do this, but it is a good way to do this. To get Christians in smaller groups praying together, connecting with people outside the walls of the church, bringing them to come and see, come and taste, to see that God is good, that he's real, that he can change your life. And to partner with God and trust that the heavy lifting, God takes the heavy lifting in all this. As I close, I want to say this. The one thing that isn't explicitly addressed here, but will become more and more explicit when you go through the Gospels or when you get into the book of Acts and the letters is, how does God partner with us? How does God bring the growth? How do we go from mustard seed to the great tree that brings rest and restoration to the world? And it's through God himself at work in our lives and in our midst by the power of the Holy Spirit. So if you fast forward this story, Jesus goes on and himself dies. He likens it in the Gospel of John as a seed that falls to the earth and dies. Jesus dies to take upon himself all guilt and shame that we might be carrying for the ways that we have messed up in life, what the Bible calls sin, our brokenness, our errors. And then he is raised to new life on the third day, what we celebrate as, as Easter in the West, as a sign that death doesn't have to find a word, that he offers us eternal life through the salvation that he offers, and he invites us into genuine relationship with God. Okay? And Jesus comes and connects us with God brings us into relationship with God. But what's interesting is in the Gospels, as Jesus leaves with the plan of returning again, as he ascends, he tells those who are following him, don't do anything yet until you are empowered from on high, until you are filled with my power, the power of God, the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. We need God, the Holy Spirit, at work in our life. We need to depend upon him in, in prayer as we walk together like this. We cannot do this without him, in other words. Jesus also says, unless you abide in me, unless you're deeply connected with me, you cannot bear any fruit. But if you are connected to Jesus, you're walking with Jesus, you're walking closely with the Lord, then you can expect to see much fruit.